So we've been uh, cruising through Daniel for a little while now. And uh, so the first half of the book, we, we saw kind of a historical outline of his life, beginning probably somewhere in his teenage years as he was deported out of his home to taken captive to Babylon, and just kind of got to see him walk through life. The second half, the second six chapters, chapter 7 through 12, kind of follow a, a timeline as well, but they don't follow the timeline of his life, but he does put them in sequence, in order. Um, and it really deals with uh, many of his dreams, many of the revelations, and in those, God told the future before it happened. He talked about nations before that they existed. He talked about the coming of the Messiah five and a half centuries before he came. He's been laying out the future in advance for us. But today, just like he's been peeling away each layer at kind of what was going on in the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire, what was going to happen in the Roman Empire... Um, he's going to peel a little bit different layer off for us today in Daniel chapter 10. See, it's really going to set up kind of the context or going to springboard off into his last vision in, in chapter 11 on through 12. But he's going to, we're going to get a little peek at some spiritual things today, some behind the scenes forces. He's going to peel a layer back for us in that. And of course, in his own personal prayer life as well, as we kind of talked about prayer a little bit at the beginning of Daniel chapter 9. Um, we're going to get a little, little deeper look at his prayer life today as well. And so Daniel now is probably somewhere in his mid-80s, could be a little older, but we'll just say mid-80s for now. It's somewhere around the year 536 B.C., and if there was ever a guy who could pass on the baton or say, hey, I've looked, I ran my race, I've done my time, I'm going to check out. It's you guys' turn to go ahead and take it up. It would be Daniel. But it seems that he didn't, that he's staying engaged in the spiritual battle. It's been now 70 years since he was taken from his home because of the war and stuck as a, as a captive of Babylon, though God has blessed him in that. And so the 70 years were up. Cyrus, the ruler of the world, if you will, the king of the most powerful empire, he's just signed a decree, and the Israelites could go back home if they chose. They could leave Babylon and go back home after this long period of time. But we're going to see some things that distress Daniel. We'll talk about that a little bit more on why. But some other things we're going to come out of Daniel 10 with is that, that he's not alone. We're going to see that he's going to be encouraged to cast out fear. That confusion is going to be exchanged for understanding, no longer bewildered. That he will be strengthened. That he shouldn't look down and not to give up, but to trust and be strengthened with the Lord. So in Isaiah chapter 39, Isaiah told the nation of Israel, hey, look, it's not going to be too much longer, and there's this nation called Babylon, they're going to come and they're going to get you. And they're going to take you into their country, but don't worry, the Lord is going to bring you back out. In fact, verse 6 and 7 of chapter 39 of Isaiah says, behold, the days are coming when that all that is in your house and all what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried away to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So those words probably rang pretty true for Daniel since that's exactly what he experienced for the last 70 years. But immediately following that revelation that God was giving to Isaiah and to his people, he takes a couple few chapters and he gives them great encouragement. Look, this is going to happen. You sinned. You messed up. You're going to go through this trial. You're going into Babylon. But he gives them a couple of 
chapters of hope and encouragement because they weren't going to be alone. They weren't to be confused. They were to be strengthened. I want to just take a couple of verses that really highlight what God's heart was to not only work with them in their trials, but to raise them up out of them. The first one, very familiar to many of us, is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And of course, the leading up to that is also a beautiful promise that he gives his people while they were going to be in this time of great struggle. The next one, as he continued on, one that I would just highlight out of that is Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He brings it on himself. He says, for you, don't fear. Don't be bewildered. Don't be dismayed. Don't be confused. Why? Because the Lord says, I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's what he says to a nation that's about to go through one of their great struggles. So with that, uh, Daniel chapter 10. So here we're going to see some of that as we saw in Daniel 39. He was going to be taken captive and made eunuchs in the palace of the king. That happened to Daniel. So we're going to see some of that strengthening as well that God promised. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. Sorry, I love to do that. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food nor meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So kind of setting up the context of what's going on here. So again, I mentioned the year, and it's been about 70 years that he's been here now. Perhaps he was taking some time because he wanted to further understand the visions that he had already received. That's possible. Or maybe he wanted some further insight. But my opinion here is that Daniel was really struggling. See, Jeremiah, in, in chapter 29, he said, look, you guys are going to Babylon for 70 years. That's going to be a fact. But go ahead and, and make your house there. Go ahead and plant a garden. Go ahead and live some life because you're going to be there for a while. Settle in. Honor God with where you are. Don't keep looking elsewhere going to be there for a little while. Well, in that, it's, you know, sometimes we get so comfortable, even in places where we shouldn't be, that when it's time for God to call us out or to set us free, we don't take advantage. We don't, we don't receive the freedom that he gives. See, because in Ezra chapter 1 and 2, which was at the same time as this, it tells us that out of the, the multitude of Israelites that were still in captivity in Babylon, we don't know precisely how many, but there was a lot, <clears throat> only 50,000 people went home. Well, less than 50,000, Ezra says. And as they went home, as they were finally set free from the bondage, only a small fraction of them actually took advantage of that. And when they did, they went back and they were going to rebuild the temple and they were going to start worshiping God again. They were going to get, begin to live for Him. But they came up against opposition so that they weren't able to finish the temple, as it says in Ezra chapter 4. And so perhaps I believe this is what really set Daniel to seek God's face. Hey, I, I thought that after 70 years we were going back. It was all done. We were finally going to have victory. We were set free. But yet we find... We find challenge. We find difficulty. You set the nation free, but only a few received it. And those who received it, it seems that they're still struggling. And so he takes a few weeks, 
and he fasts. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of fasts. Perhaps Daniel didn't fast completely from food because of his age or health. We don't know. He just fasted from what he could or what he felt called to fast from. And that's the most important thing because Jesus said, you know, hey, when, when I'm with you, you don't need to fast. That's what he said when his disciples were there. But, but when I leave, during this time when I'm gone, my disciples will fast. It's something that should be a part of the life of a Christian, whether it is whether it can be from a great many things. And here, Daniel, it wasn't complete abstinence from food. It was just pleasant food. No Krispy Kremes this month for him. No. No. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but it was no pleasant food, no meat. Wine came into his mouth, and no, he didn't anoint himself at all. So no deodorant. That's no good. He probably still ate vegetables and still ate a few things, it seems. But the most important thing is that he set himself aside to fast and to seek the Lord. See, because sometimes we can, we can shy away from those things because it looks like works and not faith. But a, a fast, whether it's fasting simply from something that you enjoy or completely fasting from food or whatever the Lord leads you to do or you're able to do, it's really about the expression of the heart. And even though it can look the, sometimes the same as works, it is really truly about an expression of the heart and building that relationship with the Lord. Real similar to marriage. A lot of people can do a lot of things in marriage just simply to get what they want. And people do that with God. They think that they can just do these works and then I'll get what I want. If I fast for three days, God will give me what I want. But it really doesn't work like that. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't fast, that we shouldn't have good works. But it is very much a relationship. It is very much an expression of the heart. It's about what pleases. It's that action that pleases the heart of the one that you love. And out of that relationship, as you build that relationship, as you passionately pursue them, as you serve them, as you say, hey, you're so special that I am willing to lay down whatever it is because I want to draw near to you, because I want to have that relationship with you, I want to draw close to you, that that response is there, whether it be a marriage or your response in your walk with the Lord. It is about building that relationship, not so much as the action. But here Daniel takes the action of fasting, and he does it for three weeks. He does it for three weeks. And I believe because he's looking around and he's saying, man, we've gotten so comfortable in captivity that we're not walking in the freedom. We're not grabbing a hold of that freedom. And those who are trying to walk in it, they're, they're just not finding victory in it. So the question for us is, if we are in that time, if we have that place in our life where God has called us, freed us from to go and to rebuild worship in that area of our life, would we be so comfortable that we don't give it up? We've been there too long, been invested too much. That's, that's too big of a stretch, Lord. I'm not going to walk in that. So where we find some of the Israelites, many of them were not going to walk in the freedom that God had just given to them. Verse 4, a strengthening vision. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz, which is kind of like, basically, it's a type of gold, like saying Black Hills gold or something to that effect. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms like feet and feet, <laughs> his arms like feet, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned into frailty in me. And I retained no strength, yet I heard the sound of his words 
And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face to the ground. Here we find Daniel sleeping during another sermon. (laughs) Poor guy. A strengthening vision. Now, people go back and forth on who they believe this is. And I'll give you my best shot at it. I'll tell you a little bit why there's a difference of opinion on it as well. Because the, the image, the revelation that God gives of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1 is almost an identical, identical um, revelation as this. And I believe that Daniel is encouraged and strengthened and gets to see a, a revelation, a view, a vision of Jesus Christ. So if you want to take your time in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, you can read a similar revelation, and that one is clearly identified as Jesus. So I believe this one here too is as well. Some people believe it's simply an angel, um, and they have multiple reasons for that. Um, But I think that as Daniel was distressed and as he was seeking God and wanting to draw near to him, that Jesus came and first off established that, hey, bud, you're not alone. I'm with you. And he shows up in power and in strength. So he receives this this vision. And really, it's a blessing oftentimes that accompanies a faithful life. In Matthew 5, 8... It says, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. John 14, 21 talks about those who have his words and keeps them. We be loved by the Father, will be loved by the Son. And Jesus Christ says specifically at the end of that verse that I will manifest myself to him. Now, whether that is something that, that we know he's there or physically as Daniel experiences is there, God will strengthen you. As we read in Isaiah 41.10, before we even got started, that He will uphold us with His righteous right hand. You're not alone, Daniel. And God would say that to you in your situation this morning or this week or whatever you're doing, is that you're, first of all, that, that you're not alone. And that's where we find our strength, whether it is somebody that God specifically puts in our life or Himself personally is that a believer in Jesus Christ, a part of the family of God, is not alone. It's a little bit like Paul's experience here where the Lord speaks and reveals himself, but those around them don't quite get it. Daniel and his crew, they were terrified, (laughs) and and they fled and hid themselves. You see, because a natural man those who have not been born again, those who have not given their life to Jesus Christ, the Bible says they can't understand or they can't receive the things of God. They don't understand them. Because unless you have been born again, your spirit, that which is inside of you, is dead. It is unable to receive, to understand, to hear, or to see spiritual things correctly. So it's a little bit like Paul's experience that he has. Daniel here clearly has eyes to see and ears to hear and receives the things of God. As it kind of closes there in verse 8, it says that my vigor was turned to frailty in me. This was such an impacting vision. This was so overwhelming for him. There's one commentator, his last name is Wood. He said that the word frailty there suggests a death-like paleness combined with a grotesque wrenching of facial features. I'm not going to try to make that face, but. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this was no joke for Daniel. He's a guy who'd been there, seen that, done that, all of that. And this was, this was something that he was undone, which is quite often the experience when you see or are near the living God. Whether you're Isaiah and says, woe is me, I am undone. Or the Apostle John falls down at Jesus' feet as if he's dead. The presence of God will impact your life. So you're not alone. Verse 10. 
Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you. And stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. And then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Now we'll see here in a minute that, that he was delayed by the prince of Persia that this messenger was. And so that's why many people, among a few other reasons, believe that this revelation that he just saw in the previous verses is not Jesus because a messenger needed help from the prince of Persia. I believe it is Jesus and don't have an issue with that because I believe that the context changes, in case you're really digging into that. From verse 9 to to verse 10, you have a change of paragraphs, and I believe you move from a vision where Daniel was asleep and seeing this vision to now awake and being touched on the shoulder by a messenger, which is probably Gabriel. So the context and everything shifts, and so I don't believe that it continues on as Jesus. Um, Therefore, he doesn't, because he wouldn't need help, for one. But we'll touch on that a little bit later as well. So... Here the vision's over, and now he's touched by an angel, a messenger of God. And he says something interesting. O Daniel, man greatly beloved. Greatly beloved. And he says, you know, a few weeks ago when you first started praying, that's when your word was heard. That's when I was sent forth. And we saw the same thing in Daniel chapter 9. That from the moment you prayed, man, you were heard. You were heard and I was sent. But a lot of people, you know, it's really easy to say that, well, you know, as as I pray or I'm seeking God or whatever it is, that I'm just not Daniel. Who is? Perhaps God wouldn't respond to me like that. Perhaps God's not listening to me in the same way. I don't feel, I don't think that I'm greatly beloved. I'm not like that. Does God think of you? Does God think of me like that? Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. There's an interesting thing that occurs here. There's a a particular word that's only used twice in the New Testament. Only used twice in the Bible, like so I guess I should say since so New Testament is the only place where Greek is used. In Luke chapter 1, verse 28, and as you know, Gabriel, who I think again here is appearing and speaking, bringing the message of God, he's talking to a little teenage girl who hasn't done great things for God, but she had a faith. She loved the Lord. And he came and he announced something to her in verse 28. It says, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. This word that's used, highly favored. You know, guys, know my linguistic skills, so have some grace. Since that's a word anyways that's here. It's a form of grace, if you will. Charis, but this one is Kara 2. Kara 2 if I was going to get really fancy. And if you look it up in your Strong's Concordance or pull out whatever your app may be and click on that word, it's used twice in the New Testament. The word down in 30, you have found favor or grace, that's used 156 times. But this highly favored one is only used twice. And here's the definition that's given to it, to grace. That is... In due with special honor to make accepted, be highly favored. That's the definition of the word there. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. The other place where this word of the highly favored one is used. 
the accepted, the beloved. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. To the praise of His glory, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by this He has made us accepted in the Beloved. He has made you the highly favored one. To the praise of His glory and by His grace, something in which you could not earn, something in which you could not accomplish, He has made you accepted in the highly favored ones. The beloved. He's made you a part of that. It's not just for Mary. It's not just for Daniel. It is for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And God says, man, welcome to the beloved. You're not alone. The Lord is with you. You're loved. You're not just loved. You're beloved. Highly favored, accepted, and loved. Back in Daniel chapter 10. We'll actually be a little bit all over the place in this section. But back in Daniel chapter 10, um, he lets us know that it was the very first day that he was sent forth. Because not only just because he was, he was beloved and because the Lord had heard his words. Verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. Now I come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. When he had spoke in such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And suddenly, one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant... Of my Lord, talk with you, my Lord. As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. So just for a little clarification there before we continue to roll on. There when it says in 17, my Lord, in verse 16, my Lord, it's, it is not like Adonai. It is more, much more of a term of like sir or older English would have said, you know, the Lord of whatever. It was, a, it was a title of respect or honor, not calling him the Lord. So here, Daniel's going to peel back another layer for us, a little bit of that things aren't as simple quite often as they seem. So in verse 13, it says that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, this was an angel. This was a messenger from God. Again, my personal opinion that it continues on since Gabriel's been so involved that it's Gabriel, but, you know, pay your nickel, make your choice. An angel nonetheless. And so when it says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, It's not speaking of a man. It's not speaking of Cyrus that somehow saw this angelic being cruising by and grabbed a hold of his shirt and said, you're not going anywhere, buddy. We know that angels from Scripture were able to accomplish things like taking out 185,000 men in an army in one night, killing them all. Cyrus didn't somehow become that powerful. This is dealing with something that is behind the scenes. To further that, he notes that Michael... One of the chief princes had to come and help him out, bail him out. Michael the archangel. Again, it says one of the princes and those who have chosen to try to interpret Michael as being Jesus. It's a good verse to show to the contrary. He is one of the chief princes. He 
He's an angel. So he goes and he helps this guy out. And so it seems for 21 days, this angel got sent out immediately as soon as Daniel began to pray. But he got hung up by a prince of Persia. Now, prince is just simply, it's not like we think of, you know, like Prince Harry or something. It is, it's more of a title of a ruler, an authority. Not, not like the one who is next in line for the throne. But before we kind of dig into that just a little bit, there are, it just happens sometimes that there are delays. Sometimes we feel like it, sometimes we notice it, and sometimes it really just is true. There are some delays when we're praying, delays in the answers. And we know it's not because we're alone, and we know it's not because we're not beloved or in the beloved. Sometimes it's simply, I think, because God wants us in His presence just a little bit longer. Slow down, buddy. Come, let's spend some time. Don't run off. Spend some time with me. Sometimes I think that God lets us kind of pray and, and doesn't answer immediately also because we need to come in alignment with His thoughts, His will. And for some of us, that takes a little bit of time. We've got a lot of our own will going on, a lot of our own thoughts, but God wants to bring us into His. So sometimes that's, that's a little something that takes a little time. And then third, other thing I'd like to note here is that sometimes it seems that we have a delay in our answers because everything that is going on is not just simply flesh and blood. It's not just simply governments or churches or people or anything else, that there are things going on behind the scenes that you have now stepped in. Well, you have actually didn't just step in. You've been in a battle your whole life. You've been in the midst of this war, this battle that has been going on, seen and unseen, since both the fall of Satan and the fall of man. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, you've just now stepped in the first chance where you could really affect it. But you were, as Paul would say, you were under the sway of the wicked one before. But now you can actually affect it. But we see here that, the, that there is this ruler this prince of the kingdom of Persia that withstood this angel for 21 days. And there was a delay in the answer for Daniel. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to bounce around in Ephesians just a little bit. A further look of kind of behind the scenes. So we know that the Lord has archangels. The Lord has messengers. He has... Um, a system and everything that he does. And we know that Satan is the great deceiver, the one who imitates that which God does or tries to rip it off. But first we start in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. Which he worked in Christ when he was raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. Jesus Christ is the head. He is over all. There is no principality, power, or demon that is comparable. That is, it's, not, it's not a battle with the Lord. Though with His angels and for us, it is. But we see that Christ is above it all. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Through 12. See, because Daniel could have thought, well, you know, it's just all about the people going back to the land and things aren't going well and the decree from Cyrus and what's going on in Persia with the king and all of this. We may think that it's Trump's tweets that are the source of all kinds of problems or whatever else. <laughs> Sorry. We may think that it's politics or this side or that side or lefts or rights or whatever else, but there is a battle going behind the scenes. Verse 10, chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because 
for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's a fact. And as we see something just as simple as the election coming up, and I pray that as you have a stewardship, that we would pray and that we would vote. Because as... um, The Lord has given us a great stewardship. And that as His people will call upon His name, and if we want our land to be healed, we must first pray and to seek Him. Voting is, is something, and it's a stewardship, and that's good. But it's not, it's not where the power and the issue really lies. And we as followers of Jesus Christ know that. As Daniel is learning and has been revealed to us, it wasn't simply just about whether or not the literal king of Persia, what, what he was doing or, or what was going on in the kingdom of Babylon, but there were things going on behind the scenes that he needed to be engaged in, aware of, that that's the reason why there was this hang-up. That's what was going on. There was this battle, not only within the physical king of Persia or kingdom of Persia, but there was a battle in the spiritual realm over Persia. And he was a part of it, and he was engaged in that. There is not only a battle within our communities and our country for doing what is right in morality or what we can see and physically affect, but there is a battle over our nation, our country, and our community, your family, your home, in the heavenly places, in the spiritual realm as well. And ultimately, we aren't fighting against a bad day or a bad rule or a bad policy because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Three times in the Gospel of John, Satan is referred to as the prince or the authority of this world. He's called the God of this world and that the people of this world are under his sway. He has hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. He has powers and rulers that are directly affecting the course of this world. It's a fact, and believers in Jesus Christ should know that. And that is our primary and first place of engagement, is seeking God, affecting those things which are spiritual. Of course, we physically do good works. Of course, we do what is right. But never forget, before you even get started in it, that you're not wrestling against flesh and blood, that this isn't simply just a physical exercise, isn't a physical action, but it is a spiritual battle. And we are taking on things that are beyond you and I. They are more intelligent, they are more powerful, they have been around longer. And we need to be in the Lord. We'll continue on in that in just a moment. But Daniel gets a glimpse at this behind the scenes. It wasn't just simply that that God wasn't listening or that God didn't hear. He shows, man, I was with you. Man, you're beloved. And here's the reason why you didn't hear from us three weeks ago when your word was first heard. Because there was a real spiritual battle going. There was a real spiritual battle going. Now, we know, we know that at the end of the story, when Jesus Christ comes back, that it will only be one angel with a great chain that wraps up Satan and throws him away, at least for a thousand years. So why the battle? Why the time? Why, why, why doesn't, you know, why can't we just say, in the, ne- in the name of Jesus, I just, you know, I claim my whole rest of my life. And it's all butterflies and unicorns from there on out. You know, why the struggle? I... <laughs> For some of it, I don't, you know, there are things about it I certainly don't know, and I am learning and trusting by faith as I walk forward, knowing who I serve and what He's called me to do. But God has called us to a battle, and it's not only to that we would leave truth behind, that we would learn it, and that we would pass it on to others and leave it on for a heritage for those who would come behind us or a pattern for the next generation that he would give us strength for the day. But it also builds for the future. 
There's an interesting illustration, and people oftentimes use it, and I like it, and I, would, I guess I would use it again. And it's just a simple illustration, and it's, it's of a caterpillar, which, you know, at a certain point in its life, decides it's time, then it needs to do something else. It needs to be something else. So it makes this little chrysalis or cocoon. I'm going to go with cocoon because it's easy. <laughs> and after that, you know, during that process, it goes through this metamorphosis and turns into a butterfly. And at the right time, it begins to break out of its cocoon. And during that process, see, at the point when it's still in its cocoon, before it begins to break out, its body is still just swollen and has everything that it needs within its, within its body. Um, and none of it is in its wings, so its wings have formed. And in the process of pushing and breaking out, it seems that this, it's just this long, drawn-out, impossible, difficult situation that it's never going to get out. And many people, there have been people in times past, oh, poor little butterfly. Let me help you out. And they do a little snipping or they open it up and help the butterfly out. And they find out when they do that it kind of plops to the ground and it's got this big old fat body and puny little wings. And then they, as they have watched that and studied it and looked at it, they found out that in the process of breaking out, in the process of working through this most difficult, challenging time of its life, that that forces the, the body fluids, for simplicity, out into the wings. And they are strengthened and they are filled. So if it, if it doesn't go through that process, it winds up, unable to fly with shriveled, undeveloped wings. But if it goes through that process, it comes out fully developed with wings that are strong enough to fly. We find this principle all, in all sorts of places in life. We find it even in our own muscles that have to be broken down to be made stronger, or our bones. You wouldn't walk by somebody at the Y who's trying to get in shape and grab their weights and say, okay, go ahead and do that. I'm taking away all the resistance. I'm taking away all the weight. Well, it wouldn't work at all. There are things in your life that God is strengthening and developing you for. There are things in the nation of Israel that God is strengthening them and developing them for. And if they are taken away, they will not develop into what God has planned for them. There is something about your life in this battle that sin has brought into the world and God calling us out that in these processes of difficult challenges of victory and defeat and struggle and battle against spiritual hosts of wickedness or the things that come into our life, that if we don't go through them, that if they simply are just removed, we will not develop into what God has for us. It's a process that we see again spiritually and physically because there is no such thing as instant maturity. It's a process that God calls us to and walks with us through. And it's not because you're not loved, and it's not because you're alone, but God is with you. God is with you. So, how do we get through that? Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 See, because it's really easy to say, okay, well, now I'm going to fast, or now I'm going to be stronger, now I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do that, and get really excited about yourself. Colossians 2.15. Well, maybe I'll back up to 13 just because it's good and we have time. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now note this. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Victory in Jesus Christ, victory in this, victory for the nation of Israel, victory for us, begins at the cross. 
That's where the enemy was defeated. That is where our power comes from. And that is where we also realize that we brought nothing to it and we have nothing of ourselves. That none of us were good enough, none of us were strong enough. And we didn't somehow just need this divine little steroid shot. Now we're good to go. We can fight any battle from there on. No, we need to constantly go back and remember that He is the source of our strength. What He has done for us, the grace of God in our life, is why we are what we are. And if we accomplish or do anything, it's because of the grace of God. And so as we fight these battles, as we see in our communities, in our lives, in our families, in our homes, not only that we are battling against physical things and we have stewardship in that, but that we are battling not against flesh and blood. And Matthew 7 says, man, keep asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. There are reasons that aren't because God loved you or He's turned a blind eye to you. There can be reasons why you're not answered immediately why you're to keep seeking, why you're to keep praying, why you're not to give up, why you're to persevere and to push forward. There are things going on behind the scenes, Daniel makes known. Don't give up. And God has given you a chance to affect things. There are many verses that I would bring to bear on this, but there's one in particular that I really felt that I should cover or at least kind of bring into this moving forward. Not to give up. And that's from 2 Kings chapter 13. An interesting, an interesting time. And to me, it's always kind of one of those paradoxes that I don't fully understand, but I'm going to walk in it anyways. So here, beginning in verse 14 of 2 Kings chapter 13... We have Elisha, the great prophet who was sick. And Joash is coming to him because he's got a lot of stuff he's worried about. So I'm going to begin reading because he's worried about the chariots of Israel and everything that's going to go on. Verse 15, And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. And so he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So, that, so he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands and said, Open the east window. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot! And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of the deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. Then he said, Take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground. So he struck the ground three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him. And said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Don't give up and don't back down. Be fully engaged in the battle. Don't pray once or twice and, well, I didn't get an answer. I didn't see what was going on. I think that's sufficient. Keep praying, keep asking, seek, keep seeking and knocking. Because God has given you a place in a battle that is significant and it's important. It continued on in Ephesians where we were and telling that if you're going to be in that battle, man, you need to put on the whole armor of God, the gospel, the helmet of salvation, truth, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness. All of these things that are not yours, they're from God. That we may be fully equipped to take on this battle that's before us. To battle the, the hosts of wickedness that are behind the scenes. Back in Daniel chapter 10. Then again, the one having likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me, and he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when the, he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return and fight with the prince of Persia. 
And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. I just want to take special note of verse 19 as it goes on to what the Lord has just been building through this. Why I started with Isaiah 41.10. Rest in the Lord. O man, O woman greatly beloved, don't fear. Fear not. God has told him this and instructed him this several times. He told Joshua that. He tells us that. He told Isaiah that. You're greatly beloved and do not fear. Peace be with you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. I tell you, we're, we're, we're leaky vessels. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with reminding each other or having the Lord through whatever message, whether it be through an angelic messenger or someone sitting beside you, of who you are in the Lord. To encourage you, to strengthen you. We can be filled with the Spirit and we can be filled with this knowledge, but somehow we just we leak it out. I hope before it all gets out, you rub it off on somebody. Splash on somebody. But it's a real fact. The person next to you sometimes is simply out of strength. And it's not because they're not the super saint. If there anybody was as much as anybody else, Daniel would be one of them. And a special messenger from heaven came and reminded him of who you are. Be strong. Be encouraged. You're greatly beloved. The Lord is with you. We need to encourage one another with these things. And don't get caught in the idea that somehow that if you do and, you're, and your ministry is to encourage or to help or to give grace, that when you share with someone, man, you are a highly favored man, you're, you're loved, or, or remind them of the grace of God that you didn't deserve, the love of God that's been poured out on your life, that somehow they're going to all of a sudden take it and, and make it a covering for their sin, or they're going to get puffed up with pride and conceit. Some people do that, but that shouldn't stop the ministry of it. Because there are, there are followers of Jesus Christ that just simply need it. And you may, as well, you may very well be that messenger from the Lord to give that to them, or to receive that today. Be strong, fear not. I'm with you. You can do it. Five encouragements. You can do it. You can do it. So don't be fearful. Receive his peace. Be strong and strengthened. So Israel, small on the earth, here we find has a mighty messenger, a mighty helper. It seems that Michael, the archangel, is especially given to Israel to defend her, to work in those powers of darkness. <laughs> what a blessing that would be. So I want to I kind of wind this down with Romans chapter 8. Because we've heard about all these principalities and powers and God is with us and all of this. I think Paul wraps up chapter 8 quite well. So it's been kind of a nice cup of grace in this chapter, and we'll be back in, we'll be back in some history next week, but it's been nice. So... As we close with this thought that he who is in you is greater than all. He's higher and above all principalities and powers. He intercedes and prays for you personally. And you cannot be separated from his love. Beginning in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. 
Now, before I continue to read, because I'm going to read just through the end of this chapter, with each aspect that he's going to bring forth, I would ask that you would kind of just bring this to your mind each time. And we know. And we know. Do you know these things? As we move forward, okay? And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called, the called, according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom He called, these He also justified. And whom He justified, these He also glorified. I hope that you know that. And I hope that you know, verse 31, that when, what we shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? I hope that you know that. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for you and I. I hope that you know that. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall Babylon separate you from that, Daniel? Shall Persia separate you? Shall distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For as it is written, for your sake... We are killed all day long, and we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And I hope that you know, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or principalities, even if they're that prince of Persia, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, not death, not Satan, not evil, not anything, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You have been accepted into the beloved. You are beloved of God. You are called and cannot be separated. But not so if you've not given your life to Him. To to have all of this, to know all of this, you must... Surrender your life to Jesus Christ and to follow Him. To turn from your sin. And this, all of these things you can know, that there is nothing in this life, there is no one nor situation that will separate you from His love. Where He cannot reach into you and to raise you up on wings like eagles. That will not strengthen you and encourage you and to bring you through. That He will not uphold you with His righteous right hand. And hopefully call us home soon. So one, be strengthened in Him and let Him raise you up. Rest in His love, two. Who you are to Him, no matter what your eyes see, do you know who who you are to Him? And again, like Daniel, leave those words, that life, that legacy for those who would come behind, that they would too would know what great love God has for them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just taking back a little bit of the veil and letting us see that, uh, Lord, it's not all about what's going on in front of us, but that there are actually things going on behind the scenes. And in you, Lord, we're not powerless, Lord, but you have given us armor and strength in your Son And you have not left us, Lord, but you have made us more than conquerors in him who loved us and who intercedes for us. Because greater is he who dwells in us than he who is in the world. God bless these guys and may they continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, as they rest in your love this week. Amen.